The solution to the problem of what to do about crime is not the leveling of property, but the improvement of character through education. It is better if desirable ends are achieved by the improvement of a citizen's character through education than by attempting to compel citizens to act in certain ways through the control or abolition of their property. As we shall see, this is a central part of Aristotle's view of property. Aristotle also claims that communism of property will reduce productivity. He writes that, dividing the care of possessions, they will not make accusations against each other, but rather they will improve as each each attends to his own. Now what does Aristotle have in mind? He probably wants us to think back to Politics 2.3 where he was criticizing the communism of women and children. He says that people who share things in common neglect those things because they think others are taking care of them. This applies to property as well. If I own one acre of land I shall most likely see to it that one acre is cared for and, and is productive. But if I am one of 1,000 citizens who share 1,000 acres in common, each acre is likely to be much less cared for and much less productive. That is Aristotle's point. Not only does private property avoid the accusations and conflicts discussed so far, it also improves the citizens' well-being by making them more productive. <clears throat> In addition to the above problems, Aristotle argues the communism of property would diminish or destroy certain kinds of pleasure. Further, with regard to pleasure too, it makes an immense difference to consider something's, something one's own. For it is not without reason that each person has affection for himself. This is natural. Aristotle is claiming that because we naturally feel affection for ourselves, what is our own is therefore pleasant to us. But it is surely unclear how or even if this, is, this infer, inference is justified. A passage from Rhetoric 1.11, however, sheds some light on the point he is trying to make. Since that which is according to nature is pleasant, and things related to each other are according to nature, all related and similar things are pleasant to each other, for the most part. For example, man is pleasant to man, a horse to a horse, a young person to a young person. And since everything that is similar and related to oneself is pleasant, and each man himself is this way most of all in relation to himself, everyone necessary, necessarily is a lover of self, more or less. For all such things belong most of all to one's relationship to oneself. And since everyone is a lover of self, one's things are necessarily pleasant to everyone individually, for examples, deeds, words, deeds and words. It does not seem at first that we have made progress, for Aristotle at the end of this passage claims that a man finds his things pleasant because every man is a lover of self. But this is precisely what we are attempting to explain. We have to see if there is in Aristotle some way of justifying this inference. A way has been suggested by Miller. True self-love is embodied in persons who act according to their own rational judgment. <clears throat> True self-love thus requires that persons be able to act according to their own judgment, and the existence of private property provides them the sphere in which they can do so. So the important part of Aristotle's argument for our purposes given Miller's suggestion and the above passages from the politics and the rhetoric, may very well be something like the following. 1. Every man or good man has affection for himself. 2. The natural, including what is naturally beloved, is pleasant. 3. Therefore, every man finds himself pleasant. 4. For a man to find himself pleasant is for him to find all those things that essentially make up his self pleasant. <coughs> his character, his own rational judgment, his actions that follow his judgment, his deeds and words. 5. By extension, a man will find pleasant whatever makes his self possible. For instance, whatever makes possible voluntary action according to his own rational judgment. 6. Having his own things, including private property, makes possible such judgment and action. 7. Therefore, a man finds having his own property pleasant. The important premises are 4 through 6. Although Aristotle does not state them explicitly, they are necessary if the argument is to be complete. Aristotle could have argued that because a person's own things are related to him, naturally or properly, he therefore derives pleasure from them. But he says more than this. 
A man gets pleasure from things that are his own because he has affection for himself. This requires that Aristotle hold something like premises 4 through 6. The important move from the point of view of the critique of Plato's Republic is Aristotle's argument that because there are pleasures in things being one's own, and since nothing is one's own in a co communistic system, where property is common, the pleasures connected with things being one's own are destroyed or diminished. Aristotle's m point may be deeper, however. If it is true, it reveals a greater problem with Plato's best city, or communism generally. For it is true, for if it is true that having things that are our own is a condition of acting according to our own judgment, then communism not only destroys the pleasures associated with things being our own and the affection we feel for ourselves, but also seems to undercut our autonomy, that is, our ability to act according to our own judgment. Still, on the subject of pleasures, Aristotle writes that doing favors for and helping friends, guests, or mates is most pleasant, and this happens only when property is private. These things do not occur for those who make the city too much of a unity. This argument is similar to the last one. 1. Generosity, like all virtues, is pleasant. 2. Generosity requires private property. 3. Private property does not exist where private property is common. 4. Therefore, generosity cannot exist where property is common. 5. Therefore, where property is common, men will be deprived of the pleasures connected with generosity. As is clear from this argument, it is actually stated in premise 4, not only is the pleasure connected with generosity destroyed, so, much, so must the virtue itself be destroyed. The communism of property will destroy the work or function of generosity concerning possessions, for no one will be known to be generous or do generous actions, actions since the work of generosity is in the use of possessions. Again, Aristotle's argument has something like the following form. 1. Generosity or the activity of generosity requires private possessions. 2. Where property is common, there are no private possessions. Therefore, 3. Where property is common, there is no generosity or no generous activity involving possessions. If generosity is destroyed, then the function or work of generosity, that is, the result of people acting generously, is destroyed. The soundness of this argument, however, depends on the truth of premise 1, as the soundness of the previous argument depended on the truth of premise 2. But can this premise be defended? Terence Irwin claims that it cannot. My own generosity may be properly expressed through my role in collective actions. It does not seem to need resources under my exclusive control. Even if we think the practice of generosity requires me to be free to dispose of some resources on my own initiative, it does not follow that the resources must be under my exclusive control. The state may loan them to me and allow me to dispose of them as I please, within certain limits and in certain circumstances. Such an arrangement would leave ample room for the exercise of generosity. We might argue that this is not real generosity if the virtuous person's action does not cost him anything and that it does not cost him anything unless he gives from his, from his exclusive possessions. But this objection seems to overlook the virtuous person's attachment to the common good. He will regard the distribution of his friend's resources as a cost to himself because he regards his friend's resources as his own, and he will take the same view of the community's resources. We might object that some identification of one's own interest with the interests of others is impossible or undesirable, but Aristotle should not be easily persuaded by any such objection, since it would undermine his whole account of friendship. Perfectly genuine generosity seems to be quite possible without private property, and to this extent, private property seems unnecessary for anything of distinctive value. There are two major problems with Irwin's argument. First, as we have seen, according to Aristotle, we will not, and indeed cannot, attend to common things very well. In fact, we tend to neglect them. For this and other reasons, I cannot feel for the community's resources what I feel for myself and my own things. I cannot really regard the former as my own. 
Second, I might regard the distribution of a close friend's or family member's resources as a cost to me since, in a sense, the goods of such friends are common. But I do not have the same relationship with the community, and thus neither do I view the community's resources in this way. Therefore, I shall indeed need my own resources if I am to act generously. It is true Aristotle would say that the communism of property could eliminate some problems. For example, if all property were common, it would be impossible to be brought to court because of debts owed. This would amount to a handful of small advantages. However, compared to a host of problems, all the problems we have seen so far. But it is just to speak but it is just to speak not only of how many evils they will be deprived of when they have property in common, but also of how many goods. This life appears to be wholly impossible. The communism of property makes life impossible, whatever problem it might eliminate. But a system of private property, however, if arranged correctly, is wholly desirable, whatever problems might remain.